We come now to section 3 of the module corresponding in this video lesson to section 3 and section 3 of the print version. This section is called the ICT scenario. We have tried to build for you what are the current trends in ICT as of today. The session aims really to introduce all of you to the range of technologies available today to introduce you to the kinds of trends in application and usage that are currently taking place and to draw your attention to some of the socio-political concerns that have emerged as a result of the use of these technologies. I use the term circa. Circa in Latin means around and about and the idea behind using the term circa 2017 is that in the field of ICTs, anything that I say today is likely to be outdated in another six months. So what I'm trying to tell you is to tell you that in the year 2017 and 18, these are the kinds of things that are in play. These are the kind of things that are happening. But I cannot assure you that these will continue in the future, or they may be replaced, or they may be something else. So the term circa is to place it within a context of a time and a space. And that is why I have used that term. So what is new about these technologies? First of all, 7 million people of the world's population live in areas covered by mobile phones. This could be in the far corners of the Pacific, or it could be in the dense cities of India and China. Mobile broadband networks, 3G, third generation or above, reach 84% of the global population, but only 67% of the rural population. By the end of 2016, 3.9 billion people, that is 53% of the world's population, is still not using the internet. In the Americas and the CIS regions, about one third of the population is out offline. So what is new? In Asia and the Pacific, in Asia and the Pacific, the percentage of the population that is not using the internet is 58.1%. That means more than half of us are not online. 52% of the global fixed band subscribers come from the member countries of ESCAP. However, North and East Asia, especially China, Japan, and Korea, and we include Singapore as a developed country in Asia Pacific, drive 75% of the connections currently in Asia Pacific. Despite this, broadband, fixed broadband penetration in Asia and the Pacific is even below the world's average of 11.2% per 100 inhabitants in 2015. So why are these figures important? These figures are important because they represent the digital divide which still persists. The digital divide is basically the gap between those who have access to digital technologies and those who do not. Compared to 80% or more of access in developed countries, only 34% of households in developing countries have internet access. In the least developed countries, many of which are in Asia Pacific, only 7% of the households have internet access compared to a global average of 46%. Look at that, a near gap of 40%. In Asia, two out of five people use the internet and three out of five people in the CIS countries use the internet. CIS stands for the Commonwealth of Independent States, comprising largely of, so, of uh, Central Asia and those countries in uh, what we might say Eurasia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, that were previously part of the old uh, uh, Soviet Union. Three in five people there use the internet. In the Asia Pacific, there are divides with 28% internet users compared to 84% in developed Asia Pacific that is within the Asia Pacific. Mobile internet penetration is 17% and 
and 3G population coverage is 13%, while in developed Asia Pacific, the figures exceed 100% of the population. So when we begin to look at what is happening in, in, in technology, it's actually a picture in which it appears very confusing and it is very difficult to come to terms with what is there. I have tried to structure it in an organized way so that we can understand what is happening in the technology world in terms of technologies, applications and usage. When we talk about the evolving technology scenario, we talk about the principle of ubiquity, anywhere, anytime and everywhere. There are wearable devices like glasses or watches which actually have the capacities of microcomputers. We also have motor vehicles equipped with Wi-Fi access. You're also familiar with tablets, with systems devices such as desktops and laptops, with mobile phones. Tablets and mobile phones are portable devices. Desktops, of course, are fixed in space and time. So these, so these enable, there's a range of devices and very often in a home one will find more than one device that is existing. So that is the kind of hardware that is available. Of course, backing all of this up is an extensive telecommunication system, also comprising of all kinds of devices such as routers and cell phone towers and cables and links. But when we begin to look at other technologies in play, we look at some of these which I will highlight. The first of these I would like to highlight is cloud computing. Cloud, which you may have heard about, is basically the practice of using a network of remote servers hosted on the internet to store, manage, and process data. In simplest terms, it means instead of storing data and programs on the hard disk of your computer, you are storing it on the cloud. What does this also mean? It means that you can have computers which are more uh, portable and lighter and you can have phones because you do not need the storage capacity uh, on, your, on your system since all materials programs are stored elsewhere on what are known as huge server farms, just buildings and buildings housing servers uh, which store the data for you and you can access these. We also have within the area of infrastructure and broadband what has been come to know, be known as the Internet of Things. Internet of Things can be explained very simply. Imagine every device having an IP number. You could control the electricity in your home, the heat in your home, you could, that is you could control the temperature, you can control the washing machine in your home, the refrigerator, through a remote device which communicate to each other. So every device has an IP address and the Internet of Things is, a, is an Internet that connects all these devices. There's also another dimension called 3D printing. What we currently see in terms of printing is what we know is 2D printing. But 3D means it is possible to print dies and casts in a three-dimensional way. This 3D printing has particular relevance to areas such as medicine where it is necessary to have a form of reality that enables a doctor to look right into, into the heart so that to devise what is, would be the appropriate um, treatment for a particular patient. So we have intelligence everywhere. The concepts of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality are all phenomena that is in play in the current scenarios. We also have something that is known as technology stacks. Technology stacks essentially are servers that are built one upon the other in order to, not, not in physical space, but that are built to connect to each other. India's example of the India stack, the foundation of which is the national identification number or the Aadhaar, that's the foundation. The Aadhaar servers connect to banks, to insurance, to social benefits, to taxation. They also have a capacity of digital storage, of providing information on demand. 
So this interconnection of servers in a hierarchical manner is what could be called a stack. Blockchain technology is an example of a stack emerging out of Bitcoin. Blockchain is a digital ledger that provides a secure way of making and recording transactions, agreements and contracts. Anything that needs to be recorded and verified as having taken place. Bitcoin is digital currency, a form of complete digital money. It's a first decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment network that is powered by users with no central authority or middlemen. From a user perspective, Bitcoin is pretty much cash for the internet. A word of caution about Bitcoin. There are concerns that have been expressed in several countries, uh, reserve banks, national banks, about Bitcoin being used as a digital currency. And that is why I would like to caution you about Bitcoin without making any judgments as to its value or lack of it. I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is one of the technologies currently at play in the world. If those were the technologies, what are the applications? First of all, what you're familiar with are the social media. A social media basically consists of a clutch of applications, often collectively known as social media, which have moved data from being a one-way driven platform to and content to two-way and interactive platforms. Earlier versions of the internet were one way. They provided information with no interactivity from the user. Today's social media enable that interactivity. These are built upon the web 2.0, uh, and that is the foundation which allows the exchange and creation of what we call user-generated content. Social media features, and this is what makes them particularly new and exciting, include participation. Social media encourages contributions and feedback from everyone who is interested. It blurs the line between media and audience. Social media networks are also open. They're open to feedback and participation. They encourage voting, comments, and the sharing of information. There are rarely any barriers to accessing and making use of the content. And uh, these are password protected content is frowned upon. You yourselves may be members of some social media network. Other key features of social media include conversation, Whereas traditional media was about broadcast or one-way, social media is about two-way or multi-way communication. Social media also have a sense of community that allow communities to form quickly and communicate effectively. Imagine a group that you have formed on the popular social medium, WhatsApp. The group communicates among itself about interests about issues and interests of common concern. This could be all the way from a love for photography, a political issue, a favorite TV show, movies, family news, or whatever. This gives a sense of the fifth dimension of social media, connectedness. Most kinds of social media thrive on their connectedness, making use of the links to other sites, resources, and people. What has happened as a result of social media, as a result of the kind of technologies in play, is that we have a situation where there are volumes and volumes of data, and perhaps if we were going to try to count the data available on the internet, we would probably do go several times around the world. The point basically is that all these all these technologies, all these applications have enabled a huge accumulation of data which has come to be known as big data. Big data remains a generic term, but it can contain any kind of data. It can be private, it can be government, it can be open, it can be closed. Big data have defining characteristics. The one is volume, that is the amount of data. Two is variety. 
that is the number and types of data. And three is the velocity, that is the speed of data processing. These three are the major features of big data. Big data alone means nothing. Data need to be analyzed and that is what has come to be known in current parlance as data analytics. The handling of big data requires analytics. And analytics, data analytics, is the process of an examining large data sets to uncover hidden patterns, unknown correlations, market trends, customer preferences, and other useful business or government information. The significance of big data and analytics for achieving the sustainable development goals cannot be overstated. Governments need to and do collect data from various sources, both within internal government departments and vast amounts of data generated in public spaces. Analytics enable the predictive planning, decision making and delivery of services through various platforms, web and mobile, and enhances efficiency, effectiveness and transparency. So data analytics within a government perspective is the analysis of all the data that government co collect through their various sources, public and private. Alongside data analytics is another small, what seems to be uh, invisible application. That's a bot. A bot is a software application that runs automatic tasks or scripts over the internet. And the value of bots lie in their ability to search and collate big data, whether for more effective marketing or better provision of services. So we have discussed until now the different technologies, the kind of uh, applications in play, and we have discussed social media. So the trends in usage are basically surrounding these four concepts, SMAC, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. The current technology scenario has given rise to several social, political, and legal concerns. First of all is the disruptive effect that technology has had on society at large and individual behavior in particular, changing the nature of human relationships. There's also a concern that machine-to-machine -machine communication, such as in the Internet of Things, where automated tasks take over, may cause massive unemployment in the IT sector, displacing workers. A third consideration is that in an ICT-dependent economy is far more vulnerable to network failures than a pre-ICT economy. And massive performance failures over the internet or power grid or cable disruptions could bring an economy or a society to a grinding halt. There are other concerns. With massive amounts of data, data privacy has become a major policy and implementation issue to be addressed by governments. Privacy of individuals, privacy of organizations, and privacy of government data. Alongside data privacy are issues of data prote protection and data security. How does one secure and prevent uh, hacking of vast amounts of data. Public opinion formation through social media applications are being used by citizens to aggregate, articulate, and express views, enabling the building of a public opinion online, an issue that governments are finding it hard to address in a fast-changing scenario. Finally, the digital divide is widening, not narrowing, particularly in the developing nations. So let me summarize this session. What I have tried to describe to you is that ICT devices have become cheaper, faster, more versatile, robust, and reliable. Mobile phones are the technology of the day, and they have overtaken all others, other technologies as technology of choice in both developed and developing countries. The digital divide still persists in the Asia Pacific as the ICT growth in the country, in the region, is driven by a few countries. 
Social, mobile, analytics, and cloud are new ways through which both the markets and government are trying to reach out to citizens and users. At the same time, the vast amounts of big data that are generated are being analyzed in order to customize and personalize relevant and timely information for consumers. For, new, for governments, these new trends are a boon, but there are very important social, political, and legal concerns in the areas of personal data privacy and security, which still have to be addressed before the use of these technologies becomes mainstream.